YouTube Live. This is our second one to do. I don't think anybody has joined me yet. We shall see. <laughs> is anybody in there yet? Okay, we've got some people are starting to show up now. And uh, listen, it's a beautiful day here in the American South. The sun is going down directly in front of me or at about 10 o'clock um, right here. And, um, and I was looking forward to, um, to getting get together with all of you again um, today. We are, just know again that we're testing, this is a new YouTube feature, doing um, YouTube live events off of your mobile phone. And so we've been testing uh, mics and this kind of thing today, but we're having some technical difficulties uh, with that. So just bear with us. Um, each one of these, as we do them more regularly, we'll figure them out and we'll get a little bit better at this. But again, it's a gorgeous day here in the American South. I mean, what can you say? And I've got Ranger the Rescue Dog over here with me. Can you see him over there? He is, uh, he is sitting in one of his favorite spots, uh, looking out over the water to see if there's anything that he thinks, uh, you know, needs to be killed. <laughs> Ranger, it's, it's interesting. If you've never had a German Shepherd, German Shepherds, you know, listen, I should get some kind of kickback from, uh, you know, like German Shepherd societies or something, because I think German Shepherds are just the best dogs ever. And... Um, and one of the reasons I think that is because not only are they great with people, as I said yesterday, but they also take very seriously um, their job of, um, you know, patrolling. And, uh, and, and shepherds are always on patrol. So I hope you're doing well. I see people from, let's see, we have somebody here from Scotland, from Pittsburgh, from the UK. Uh, where else is the, uh, the uh, ranger? Um, Mary Michelle says hello. Um, we got people checking in from all over the place. Let me see where you're from. Buffalo, New York. Somebody here has a Malinois. Malinois are basically a sort of an offshoot of, um, of German Shepherds, Belgian equivalent of that. Reading Pennsylvania, Oregon. Fantastic. Ah, good. Keith is lighting up a cigar. Light one up for me. I would, Keith, but I, uh, I just didn't think of it. You know, funny thing about from from uh, Texas here, from Tennessee, South Yorkshire, England, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, Nacogdoches, tennis, uh, Texas. Excuse me, Texas get upset with that. You know, I had a colleague named Chris Thomas. I wonder if it is the same colleague. Anyway, so I got a little time here. Um, with you, I got a nice little fire going in the background, and um, gosh, I love, I love a spring in the American South. I really do. Colorado, another from Texas, um, checking in. Liverpool, I got Liverpudlians here. Rhode Island. See, we are. There are conservatives in the American Northeast. We're gonna make a lot of them by the time that we're done. The posse is growing. So what are some good questions, some good topics that you guys have that perhaps you would, you'd like to discuss? Adelaide, fantastic to see somebody joining us from Adelaide. It's probably late in the day for a coffee, but I made one anyway. Any thoughts on the solar eclipse is a question here. Sadly, none. I have nothing intelligent to say about solar eclipses. My apologies. Um, April 6th, my opinion of April 6th. You know, this is an, this is an interesting topic because I knew people um, who were there. I didn't go and I don't think I even knew really too much about the event. And I, I've just never been somebody who attends political rallies. It's just, it's just never been my thing. I, I mean, I'm not a concert goer, 
None of that kind of stuff do I have a tendency um, to do. But I had some friends who did go. And then, of course, you saw um, you know, media immediately talking about insurrection. And did you notice that everybody was using that word? Uh, you would almost think a memo had gone out <laughs> in which they were all told um, to use the word insurrection. And, of course, they were told to use that word. And... Um, I thought, wow, you know, something horrible must have happened. Uh, these people must have really, uh, you know, uh, stormed the Capitol. You know, you're, you're thinking something like the storming of the Bastille or the Winter Palace and the Russian Revolution, both of which are great fictions, by the way. And um, as, as was this one, that I talked to people who were there and their description of what happened to me was very interesting because they said that they and other people with them, now this is, you know, this, this is a conversation I had, you know, within a week or two of, of the event itself. These were people who were telling me, look, we were pretty sure that there were people who had penetrated the crowd, who had their faces covered, uh, who were plants, who were made to look like they were uh, Trump supporters and they were pushing up through the crowd um, to get up to the doors. And um, everyone was trying to keep them from getting up there, trying to prevent them from doing what they were doing. They said, oddly, you know, the, uh, the, the Capitol Police really weren't. They were facilitating it. So, you know, these, these are all things that, that tell you the fix is in. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, Democrats do not want to enforce laws except for anything they can find on any conservative anywhere. So a... Um, you know, you have stories of um, uh, people who are being murdered um, by, um, by some illegal aliens. Uh, those individuals receive almost zero punishment, and there's no justice for the victim. We're seeing more and more of that kind of stuff. And that's because this is banana republic uh, tactics that we're seeing uh, employed here. And if you talk to people who lived in banana republics, they will tell you um, this is the kind of stuff that I grew up with. Um, so I've had people, you know, having conversations with people who are, say, from China, older people, from China, from uh, Vietnam, uh, from Korea, as well as from South America, say, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Chile. They're all people who have seen these kind of tactics before. Less so younger people, younger generation, but older people do tend to... Um, tend to have seen these things before. What about Israel? Well, I've done a podcast. In fact, I think I've done, I've probably done a couple of podcasts on Israel. And rather than me, you know, trying to give you a, a, a condensed version of that here, I would prefer to point you to the podcasts themselves, which are far more thoughtful and um, prepared in what I have to say on that. But I think you'll, you'll find the history and the background of this conflict very interesting. You know, in an hour or even two hours or 10 hours, there's only so much that you can say. I can't cover uh, every base in that and make absolutely uh, everyone happy, but I do think I can give you, uh, and this is kind of what I, I hope to do on Ideas Have Consequences. It isn't so much that I wanna provide you with the answer to every question as if I had them. I mean, I, I don't have the answer to every question, but I hope to give you a grid um, for understanding the world, a way of thinking, a way of processing um, issues and information, a lens towards understanding the world. Um, a good Bible teacher, it isn't just that, that he goes through the Bible, or a good teacher, period, but let's just say, for the sake of my illustration, a Bible teacher. A good Bible teacher doesn't just simply um, explain to you the meaning of a collection of verses, though that is a portion of what he does. But as he's doing it, you're learning from his methodology how he's doing it. And from that, it's something I've always thought John Lennox was brilliant at. If you don't know who he is, he's a dear friend of mine, um, something of a mentor to me. I visited him fairly recently in Oxford. He makes a kind of a cameo appearance on a documentary uh, about the World Economic Forum. But what John does when John is, he's a mathematician and a scientist, an Oxford mathematician and scientist, but he's also a great Bible teacher. And one of the things that I think John does is when he's done teaching on a given 
subject, you've come away with something much more than just an understanding of the topic of the sermon. He's put tools in your toolbox so that you can come away and apply that methodology that you saw him use to other topics, to other issues. And that's something that I very much want to do because I want people to think for themselves. I want to teach people how to think critically, how to process the bigger issues and the things that are happening around them. I was very blessed to have teachers, not all Christians, uh, some of whom were, were, were atheists and of, um, and of other faiths, but I was very blessed to have some great, and in some cases, some famous uh, professors, thinkers, teachers, who taught me to think, who taught me to think for myself, and they forced me to defend it. They forced me to defend what I believed. And um, there's something value in that. I, I, I'm thinking in this particular moment, though he by no means was the only one, but Forrest McDonald. Forrest McDonald was uh, the late Forrest McDonald. He was a great man, in my opinion. Forrest McDonald was uh, a very famous um, American historian. He guided uh, my thesis, and uh, I, was, I was fortunate to have a class with him, a graduate class, but most graduate classes are, are quite small, uh, particularly um, in, a, in a subject like history or philosophy. So there's just three of us, just three of us, um, several hours a week. So you were under intense scrutiny uh, from him. And um, if you weren't prepared, you're gonna get gutted in, in, in class because you couldn't hide. It wasn't, it wasn't like there were 30 people in the class and the class was 50 minutes long. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about a, a you know, class that ran a couple of hours, three times a week. And um, what McDonald would do was force you to take a position. And then he would force you to defend the position. He didn't demand that you agreed with him, um, but he did demand that you have evidence for what you believed and it made sense. And of course, McDonald was, was uh, nominated for Pulitzer Prize back when it mattered. And, um, and he got me, got my thesis published. I was so grateful for that. Um, when I came out of that class, he said, your thesis is publishable. And um, if you let me, um, I'll help you get it published. Just in some kind of academic journal that nobody ever read, I'm sure. But it was a feather in my cap and, and got me started. But the point is, I'm grateful for that kind of um, rigorous training. And it's something that I hope to do on Ideas Have Consequences, that we take an idea, we show you the consequences of the idea, but in so doing that I provide you with, with some tools in your toolbox that gives you the confidence uh, to engage the world, to engage the people around you. That's something that I very much want to do. And you'll have to forgive me. If somebody says there's glare on my face, uh, let me try moving it in just a little bit. Um, I don't know if that helps. Um, it looks to me like I have a good visual here, but I don't know, I can't say what you're seeing. Um, I don't see your screen, but my screen is supposed to be uh, basically um, what, what you're seeing. Somebody's asking me here about what I think about Kate and Charles and all that's going on there. I'll disappoint you again, I have no idea. Um, I did see the video of her saying that um, she was, you know, wanted privacy when she's talking to her children. Uh, breaking it to them um, that she has had um, cancer. Uh, I, I think, what is it, abdominal or intestinal or stomach cancer? God bless her. Um, she deserves um, that. She de deserves that privacy um, to do that. And I will tell you, I think the way the royal family has historically been treated is frequently horrible. I, I wouldn't want that job for anything. I loved Queen Elizabeth II. I loved Queen Elizabeth II. Um, I thought she was fantastic. I do not like King Charles. I don't like Charles at all. I can't stand Harry or Meghan. I mean, they make me want to vomit. <laughs> but um, Kate strikes me as a remarkable woman, but um, dealing with what are probably very, very difficult circumstances, but I can't claim to be a royal watcher. I'm a royal watcher as a historian. I taught the history of Britain for a very long time. I'm a royal watcher of centuries past but not the, um, the era of basically celebrity royals who uh, politically are generally fairly meaningless. Um, other questions here. Someone here says Elizabeth was my queen. I, listen, I, Sean, I think, that, I think that Elizabeth was much beloved the world over and America as a republic, I mean, we are by definition as a country anti-royal, right? 
but the American people, American people of any sense, loved Queen Elizabeth II, and why wouldn't they? I have to tell you a wonderful story about her that on the day that she died, her um, longtime bodyguard, who was, I'm sure, long past being able to actually defend her physically, he looked like he was in his 80s, but he told this wonderful story um, of being out for a walk with her um, near Balmoral Castle, which is the royal residence in Scotland. And he said that she loved to go for walks there and they were out for a walk. And um, a couple was coming towards them. Um, this fellow said, a ranger is wanting me to uh, get his bone. Hey, bud. Hey, buddy. Anyway, um, this couple came and he said, I'm wearing um, a kilt. And this couple, he said, which was an American couple, were fascinated with my kilt, but they didn't know who the queen was. And they asked her if she would take a picture of them with me. <laughs> and he said, Queen Elizabeth smiled and said she would be happy to do that and um, took a picture. And then she said to them, as she gave the camera back, she said, you know, you might want to get a picture of me with the two of you. And so she did. Um, the bodyguard took the picture of that and gave him the phone and they asked her if she lived nearby. And she said, I have a nice little place near here. <laughs> what a, what a remarkable, what a remarkable woman. Ranger is a sweet boy. Yes, he is. Aren't you, buddy? Aren't you, bud? Yeah, he's wanting some attention. He's wanting some attention right now. So you can see this guy right here. Oh. <laughs> so, other questions. I'm not probably your guy for the for the modern royal family, honestly. I I can't say that I follow them um, that that closely. Other questions? You know, um, I do hear people say frequently that they think King Charles III uh, has some involvement. I mean, he's obviously involved with the World Economic Forum, but some people who will say that he's the one who's really the puppet master and sort of running the WEF and, uh, and running the show. I have to tell you, I couldn't disagree more strongly. Um, Charles is not bright. He is not bright. He is just simply a puppet of globalists. He'll say what they, they tell him to say. He wants to stay uh, in the good graces of British media. He wants to be liked. And because of that, he's willing to lick his finger and put it in the wind and see which way um, the, uh, the cultural zeitgeist is blowing and then adopt that position. Charles is not nearly intelligent enough to run anything like the WEF. Absolutely not. Um, I think you have other people you know, who are behind that. Favorite hymns. Do I have favorite hymns? Yes, I do. Um, I love victory in Jesus, but I don't like, I don't like it when it's, I, I recall a music minister from years ago, he played a guitar and, uh, and he would sing that with rapidity, I mean, with, with really fast, uh, really up-tempo, and I loved it, versus the victory in Jesus. I mean, God, that doesn't, that doesn't to me like, sound like victory. Victory in Jesus should be an up-tempo. I love that. I love um, How Great Thou Art. I have a hard time singing that and getting through it because I do love it. Um, oh gosh, there are, there are many others that I love very much for whatever reason, I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but I do love, I hope Victory in Jesus will be, somebody will sing that at, at my funeral because that's what I hope my funeral is, is a celebration of a life and somebody who's in heaven and doesn't wanna come back. Do you think people on the left believe they are sinners? No, I don't. Um, I think they're full of their own self-righteousness. As I was saying, I think it was yesterday I was saying this, People frequently think that self-righteousness is a product of um, some kind of religious belief and that non-religious people aren't self-righteous. Absolutely false. Self-righteousness, legalism is a product of human nature. Some of the most 
legalistic, self-righteous people I've ever met are, are the mask Nazis, the vax Nazis, um, are the recycling Nazis. I mean, these people are, they, they are every bit as legalistic, you know, as the, uh, you know, Saturday Night Live church lady or the most extreme Islamic state. They are hugely legalistic. And, um, and it's important to understand that the secular ideologies can drive that kind of legalism. And um, man, um, do we see that in a very big way. And so I don't think these people see themselves as sinners. I think they see themselves as good people, as righteous, as individuals who um, are doing good for humanity. I love something that C.S. Lewis said on this topic. He said for, and I'm really, really loosely quoting him here, but he said for a man to do that which is really, truly, hideously evil, he must first believe that what he is doing is in the best interest of the people. And these are individuals who think like that. I mean, you have Bill Gates, Bill Gates pontificating about what he's going to do for, for humanity. Who elected Bill Gates? Who the hell does this man think that he is? That he's releasing, you know, um, bio, um, um, biogenetically uh, engineered um, mosquitoes uh, into um, into U.S. airspace in Florida. Um, as a guy who is, you know, vaccinating uh, mass populations, who does he think he is? Um, well, all Bill Gates is is a guy with a lot of money. I, I wouldn't even say that he's a particularly good coder or programmer. I mean, his his software, I, I just can't say is all that great. So I think, that, but I do think that Bill Gates thinks of himself as someone who's doing good for humanity. Other questions? Let me back up here just a bit. I've been told I can do this. Yes, I can. Um, I, someone says here, I still see people with masks occasionally. Today I was in the bank and I was just chatting with um, the ladies behind the counter who were very helpful and nice people and there was you know nothing ideological stated in our conversation. And so I saw something, I don't know what it is, but something that made me ask them. I said, hey, do you think that masks are coming back? And the response was interesting because one of them said, um, well, you know, I didn't mind wearing a mask. It probably did a lot of good. And the other one said, gosh, I sure hope they don't come back. What, and then they both said, you know, what do you think? And I, I wasn't, you know, I, I'm wanting to conduct business. I'm not wanting to, I'm just wanting to have a friendly conversation. I don't want to be in a, um, you know, conflict. I said, well, you know, I, I actually think masks did quite a lot of damage. And both of them seemed a little surprised. They said, how's that? And I said, well, I mean, I think more and more information is coming out indicating that it did massive, irreversible damage to children in speech development. Firstly, and I said, and secondly, because anything that's up to your face like that, um, I mean, you're breathing in your own carbon dioxide. I mean, imagine doing that to your automobile. You know, if, if for your automobile you you, you've choked off um, the exhaust. I mean, everything that's coming out, you're trying to force back into it. Uh, well, there's a reason it's being burned off. It's because <laughs> it's harmful, it's, it's not useful. Um, anyway, they were both kind of intrigued by that, but uh, I still do see people like that. My own feeling about that is uh, don't shame people in, in, we in wearing masks, uh, or for that matter, in not wearing masks. Um, some people may be wearing them for reasons you don't fully understand. It may have nothing to do with COVID. They may be wearing them. For instance, I see people wearing them frequently when working in their yards. And there's a good reason for that because all the dust and debris when you're mowing, it will keep that out. It won't keep an aerosol out, but it will keep some of that kind of stuff out from getting into your face. And um, you just don't know what reason is that they might have it. And my own personal feeling is, they have that right to do that if they want to. I don't want to do that, but if they want to do that, then they can do that. My problem is, is when people, and again, it's the very legalistic people that I was just talking about who try to force that kind of stuff on you. They say to themselves, because I, I am wearing the, the mask, I'm going to make you wear the mask, or I'm going to make you do this, or I'm going to make you do that. That's, that's of a mentality 
that I can't stand. I just don't like that. Other questions? Somebody here says WTF, and I don't know what a, that is in relation to. Hopefully not to me. Um, will Sasha ever write her, my daughter Sasha, will she ever write her version of The Grace Effect? You know, um, you can find the podcast where I interview Sasha. Uh, it's very interesting because Sasha will tell her story um, maybe once every couple of years. Uh, it's very hard for her. It's emotionally hard, uh, even a little traumatizing. And after Sound of Freedom came out, if you, if you don't know who Sasha is, Sasha is the, my daughter. She is our adopted daughter. We adopted her from Ukraine in 2011. Excuse me, in 2009. And um, Sasha, 2011 is when the Grace Effect came out. Um, Sasha was 10 years old um, at the time of her adoption. And, um, you know, she associates a lot of bad memories um, with Ukraine and for good reason. Um, but after Sound of Freedom came out, which dealt with the subject of uh, human trafficking, I, you know, I asked Sasha, would you like to come? And we went to see it together. Uh, she and I um, and her husband, Dalton, we went to see it. And uh, she had a strong reaction to it because she could relate to, um, to many aspects of it. And I asked her if she wanted to come on the podcast to talk about it. And she said she would, but she'd prefer I just tell her story and she'll listen and say a few things every now and then. <laughs> and I said, well, what if I interview you? She said, well, you do most of the talking because you know my story. You know the story. You tell the story. And when I feel like it, I'll say something. And uh, so that's what we did. And there were some people who were critical who said, oh, you didn't let her talk. Well, I promise you that is because Sasha, I know my daughter, and um, Sasha finds telling the story hard. So she, she mostly um, listened. But we knew that that story would be very encouraging to a lot of people, be very meaningful to a lot of people. And of course it was um, very powerful for, um, for a lot of people to hear that. I uh, gave them insight also into Ukrainian corruption. I mean, Ukraine is an incredibly corrupt country, as is, uh, as is Russia, and unfortunately, as is the United States these days, uh, at least at the federal level. And um, anyway, um, so she told her story. Um, but Sasha will occasionally speak in a church, uh, maybe to a youth group or something, and tell her story. But she only does that maybe about maybe about every couple of years because she finds it it draining. And then for usually a few days afterwards, Sasha's a little off. And you know it's because this is dredged up memories and places where she doesn't want to go, uh, understandably. But Sasha's story is very powerful. And um, as I say in The Grace Effect, if grown men are allowed to have heroes, Sasha is my hero. She is a remarkable young woman. You should read the Grace Effect. If I could only, if I could suggest you one book that I've written that you read, it would be The Grace Effect, um, because um, I'm I'm telling the story of what a culture looks like absent absent Christian influence, absent Christian belief, and then what it looks like when it when it has Christian belief, and that's what I call the Grace Effect. A whole a whole society can be changed by grace. And not because everybody becomes a Christian, but because Christian influence begins to spread um, throughout the culture and is reflected in the moral sensibilities of everyday people. It is reflected uh, in, um, in, in movies and literature and in government and in all sorts of things. And this is the thing that a lot of people on the left, um, a lot of unbelievers don't understand they will miss. Uh, this was reflected in the comments of Richard Dawkins a few days where he, he says he regrets the demise of Christianity in Britain. Well, there's more people than him who are starting to feel that way because they see what's coming behind the Christian faith. And it's either, again, radical Islam or it is radical uh, secularism, globalism. And there's no grace in either one of those. There's no grace in those at all. And whereas in times past, you would have, and maybe you feel like this is a, a silly example, but I'm just talking off the, the top of my head here. If you go and watch old episodes of something like, say, Andy Griffith, or All Creatures Great and Small, whether it's the old one or the new one, by the way, 
Those are not Christian shows, but those are shows that are shot through with common grace. Those are shows that are shot through with Christian influence. The, the episodes themselves, often the moral of the story is one that, that no Christian could reasonably object to because those are shows that are the product of a Christian culture. That stuff is disappearing from the culture. And instead, what is replacing it is often grotesque, it's uh, extreme horror, um, it's satanic stuff that is now bleeding into the culture. And I would say to you that unbelievers of 30 years ago would be horrified by the stuff of today because while they would say they weren't Christians, they, would, they didn't realize that they had very strong Christian sentiments and sensibilities that informed their worldview. Well, once that stuff is gone, uh, once Christianity has been driven from public life, uh, as I say, barbarism is all that will remain. Let's see um, what we uh, what we have here. I'm going to change my glasses now because the sun is almost almost out of my face. You have somebody here saying that uh, Bill Gates got the pie in the face. Yes, he did. Um, do the Venezuelans know they're being used is a question from Maria. Um, I think some do, uh, some don't. I've talked to a lot of Venezuelans and that's because um, as I've made pretty clear when I'm talking about the um, uh, illegal aliens, when I'm talking about the migration issue that's happening outside of the United States, moving towards the United States or into Europe, um, I'm chiefly talking about those who are coming from Central and South America because those that are coming from places like Afghanistan and Somalia and so on, that's a, that is a whole different ball of wax because you're talking, about, you're talking about people who do not share our belief system, um, do not want to preserve it, do not respect our women, uh, do not have the same core values. And that's highly problematic. And that's what you're seeing is taking place in Britain so that um, the, uh, you know, the crime rate uh, has gone up massively. Um, you, uh, if you're not familiar with it, I've talked about it many times, trying to make people aware of it. Here in the, in the United States, something called the Rotherham scandal. That's R-O-T-H-E-R-H-A-M, Rotherham. Rotherham uh, scandal, Rotherham is a, is a city in England where it was discovered that, um, oh, thousands of British white girls um, were the, um, the victims of ongoing uh, sex gangs that were mostly um, Afghan and um, uh, some from Bangladesh. Um, but when the Times reported this in, I'm not sure what year, maybe 2012, the, uh, the Times of London, which was courageous, I'm glad that they did. Um, but they first, the reporter had written it quite accurately as to who it was who was doing this, that these were chiefly, chiefly people um, who you know, were coming from a completely different religious um, frame of mind. And, uh, but the Times editorial staff, you know, they were required to change what they said. And so rather than identifying them as Muslims or as Afghans or as um, uh, Pakistanis, they had to call them Asians. So when that article came out, understandably, um, Chinese, um, Sikhs, uh, others were outraged. They said, no, no, no. These crimes are not being from one demographic and one demographic only. And uh, now it's been uncovered that no less, this is as of, you know, like 2019, so who knows how many girls uh, there are now, but um, about 19,000 British girls and almost nobody, they're being trafficked, um, to quote the Times, industrial scale trafficking all over Britain. Uh, police were involved, uh, taxi drivers were involved, um, restaurants were involved, and all of one religious persuasion that we're doing this. See, you have to forgive the noise. Seaplanes take off and land here frequently, very near my house. It's kind of a kind of a taxi service. They're kind of cool to watch, but kind of a problem when you're trying to have a, uh, a YouTube live event. But that's that's what you're hearing in the background. That's not Ranger. <laughs> that's a good boy. Anyway. Um, 
So those were not people who were coming out of Central and South America. Those were people who were coming out of, uh, coming out of Muslim countries that were doing that. And so that concerns me greatly. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that concerns me greatly. But those who are coming out of Central and South America, uh, they're different, um, of a different um, worldview and um, uh, perspective. It is to say there, there aren't uh, many criminals among them. Uh, certainly there are. Um, but generally speaking, that's not the case. And most of them are, um, which is kind of reflected in the question here by Maria. They're coming out of Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela has been absolutely trashed uh, by socialism, by Maduro's government over the last course of the last 10 years. It's been it become um, you know, really impossible for a lot of families uh, to sustain themselves economically, feed themselves as they once could. So they started pouring into, um, into Colombia. Well, last year, um, I, I'm really suspicious of the, uh, of the integrity of the election, but, but an, an outright terrorist, um, Petro, um, took power. Uh, I'm a, a, a um, Maduro friend. Uh, Maduro is the, you know, is the president of, um, of Venezuela. So now Petro, uh, an out-and-out -out Marxist terrorist, is now the president of Colombia. So all these people who are pouring from Venezuela into Colombia, looking for jobs in Colombia, are now looking to get out of Colombia too because Colombia is now going to go the direction, sadly enough, that Venezuela has gone. Let's see um, what else is going on here. By the way, this comment I think is absolutely true where Keith says, um, God has given them over to a reprobate, reprobate mind. I, I think what Keith is referring to here is my commentary on the left, on these globalists, and I think he's right. Um, as I've been saying for quite some time, I think this is uh, Romans chapter 1. We're living out Romans 1 verses 18 through 32. I uh, strongly encourage you to go and read those verses. They are great to read. Um, let's see now. Other questions is Bridget Macron a man? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. You see all these rumors, you know, that are related to these kind of things. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of glad to say that, uh, I'm kind of glad to say that I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't want any kind of intimacy with Bridget Macron. That is not an attractive woman. There's uh, Bella Cruz here says there's still a guy in um, my area that wears a mask and wears rubber gloves uh, in an unclosed car about town. That is unusual, but don't, don't immediately judge those people. Um, and I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you because my immediate reaction, if I saw somebody do that, would probably be want to take a picture of them and tweet them <laughs> and make fun of them. Uh, but it's probably not the most effective um, thing to do. I do believe that one of the most interesting things that I thought was revealed in the pandemic, and this had, this had no ideological boundary. This, this ran both among conservatives and, um, and liberals, uh, Democrats, Republicans, globalists and anti-globalists. This ran across the board. We learned there are a lot of people who are afraid to die. I mean, really afraid to die. Um, and maybe that seems to you like, well, no, everybody should be afraid to die. No, I don't think you should be. I think if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, um, I don't think you should fear death, and I certainly don't think you should live life making all the big decisions in your life based off of fear. Um, I, please understand, I'm not telling you to go base jumping and you know go and do stupid things where you risk um, fatality. That's not quite what I mean. But rather, I mean that this life carries with it a certain measure of risk, doesn't it? I mean, whether it's when you get into your automobile or you're flying or whatever it is that you're doing. And um, um, I guess I grew up of a, of a mentality and I grew up in a military family. Uh, my father was a career soldier, so I grew up moving from one fort you know, to the next. I, I grew up with a mentality 
that some things are worth dying for. And uh, I very much believe that, and I've tried to live my life like that. Uh, now, if somebody you know, breaks into my home, I don't mean that I'm gonna be cavalier and just sit here and think, you know, I really don't care what happens to me. I mean, I would, I would defend myself. I would seek to defend myself. Rather, what I mean is that I was a little embarrassed. I wanted to turn and you know, <laughs> look the other way, so to speak, because I had friends who wouldn't leave their houses or were terrified to have interaction. And, and again, we're talking about conservatives. We're talking about Christians who were terrified to engage with people who weren't wearing masks, who wanted to social distance, who, who um, you know, were constantly getting vaxxed up and stuff like this. And I found it frankly embarrassing for them because I just thought, really, is this, is this way you're gonna live your life? I mean, because it isn't the way I wanna live my life. I, I don't wanna live my life in, um, in absolute terror. What, what kind of life is that? Um, and uh, early on, we endeavored to comply as much as possible because if you recall, uh, much of this was being pushed by Trump. It wasn't being pushed by DeSantis, it was being pushed by Trump. And um, so I thought, well, you know, this is, we're hearing this both from our side and from the other side. And uh, until we really know what we're dealing with, um, I don't think I wanna be a fly in the ointment. And then it became pretty clear that we were dealing with uh, governments that were vastly overreaching um, their power and their authority, their constitutional authority, and um, they needed to be resisted. But again, there are just a lot of people who live in fear. They, they, they live in real fear. And um, that's given me cause to think a lot about the demise of Western culture, which I, I tend to be harder on men when it comes to that than I am on women. And in part, because I think that the crisis has come about because so many men um, have abandoned their posts. Uh, they are no longer willing to take risks. Uh, we have become an Epicurean society. It's all about my comfort. It's all about my personal comfort. You know, I'm not willing to take risk. I'm not willing to risk my wealth or my comfort, much less my life. And that to me is, that's shameful. That's shameful. Um, it really is. Um, I, I also think this, and this is maybe a podcast, but I, I will have people who will come on, um, let's say the YouTube or comment section or maybe on Twitter, and who will say that me speaking out is courageous. Um, I really appreciate that. I really do appreciate people saying things like that because I think it's meant sincerely and it's meant as a compliment. But when just simply stating the truth um, and where at this point, um, and this will change, it's, it's obviously changing very rapidly, what I'm facing isn't being burned at the stake, but uh, being suppressed um, by a format like this, maybe losing my livelihood, maybe being you know, trashed on social media, uh, maybe major media trashing me, which they've done multiple times, uh, maybe being ostracized. We've really lowered the bar as to what constitutes courage. I mean, we have really lowered the bar as to what constitutes courage. I have friends in the third world who are risking their lives every day. And um, I would not be able to look them in the eye if um, when they asked me, hey, Larry, why did you speak out about that? And I said, well, some people said some bad things about me on, on Twitter or, you know, gosh, I didn't, I didn't want my friends to see that post or I was, I was afraid, you know, um, I'd lose a sponsor, you know, or something to that effect. When, when, that, when that's what constitutes courage, we've lowered the bar and we must raise the bar and we must demand courage of men in our society, women too, but I think particularly of men. I'm very disappointed in what we say of men. Dawkins, somebody here says, um, Dawkins saying that was wonderful. I know it was hard for him to admit. You know, I don't think so um, for this reason. Um, and I, I don't see this as his servant who says this. Um, uh, not so much for this reason. Um, I just recorded a podcast yesterday, which will come out on Tuesday of next week, talking about this. But if you read my book, The Grace Effect, in two th which was published in 2011, 
Dawkins was saying that back then. I quote him as saying that back then. So this isn't anything particularly new for him to say. And it's something he knows that will get him a lot of attaboys from, uh, um, from elements of society. Um, and to me, it's a comment that makes no sense. Uh, it makes no sense. I, I, to me, and listen, I like Jordan Peterson, but I'm not interested in what Jordan Peterson has to say on theology. I'm not interested in what he has to say on the Bible. Jordan, you need to receive Jesus Christ. I mean, for you to tell people what the Bible says when you don't believe, you don't accept the central message of the Christian faith, <laughs> that Jesus was God made flesh, you're missing it, brother. I mean, I, I, I don't think you have anything to really say to people about the Bible until you show that you actually understand it and you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And to me, it's the same thing as what Dawkins is doing. Dawkins says, I really appreciate, I really, really appreciate the Christian faith. And then he said, but I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe a word of it. Again, it's like me sitting here. I'm watching the sun go down right here. And it's like me saying, oh, I love a beautiful sunset. I love the sun's rays. I love the warmth of the sun, but I just don't want the sun. I could do without the sun. That makes no sense at all. It makes no sense at all. Oh, we have one here. James says, I worked in Rotherham for five years. Uh, you'd see young white girls with Asian kids absolutely everywhere. Yes, they used Asian, and not just Asian, Pakistani and Afghan. Let's be clear here. They weren't using Chinese boys. They weren't using Korean boys. Uh, they weren't using Indian boys. They used these smooth face prepubescent um, boys, Muslim boys, who look very handsome before they take on, you know, a really heavy beard, who, what do they do? Um, I tried to do this with my daughter, Sasha, by the way, um, when we were living in France, you see the same thing, is they will tell girls how much they love them. Um, they're grooming them. This was, this is the way it would work. Give them candy, then take them for a ride, and then the next thing you know, um, they're, these girls are being drugged. They're being filmed having sex with men. And, uh, and then they're told, um, listen, um, we're going to upload this, uh, this video here. We're going to upload it on YouTube. We're going to send it out to your friends and family unless you do what you tell us to do. And so what would happen is, is these girls would be moved around England and they were all at risk youth. So these were, these were girls mostly from broken families and hence, I mean, they were choosing carefully um, the girls that they wanted. They wanted girls that, that there really wasn't anybody really looking after them. They'd be moved around by taxi drivers and the like, uh, taken to a home, um, threatened or drugged, and men would come into the house and would be paying um, the, uh, the person who was essentially holding the, the girl captive to go and have sex with a girl. This was happening, a uh, chill, bud. He just saw a Democrat. Um, anyway, that's that's the way this was done. It was being done in a um, it was being done in a very big way. Uh, let's see what else here. Other questions here. Yes, someone here says Sean says they were coming from broken homes. Absolutely, they were coming from broken homes. Uh, wickedness in high places. All very true. Um, I'm so glad here, Robert Thompson says, I'm so glad you came across um, my channel. Robert, we're glad to have you part of the posse. Join the posse. We're gonna do some pretty cool things. I'm pretty excited about some of the stuff that we have um, in the offing in the future. And by the way, look, for those of you who might just be joining right now, do bear in mind that what we're doing right now, we're just testing. I, I tried to turn the, the camera into, um, what do they call it, portrait mode, but uh, apparently for YouTube Live, it won't let you do that. Either that or you have to pay for some kind of upgrade or something, but it's a better visual uh, to, I think, to have it, you know, in portrait mode. Uh, and we'll eventually, you know, have some kind of um, mic that works uh, so that I can set the camera a little further away from me and maybe you can see a, uh, a more, more interesting background behind me. But I'm just sitting out here on the porch and I have a nice little, little fire going here, which, I enjoy very much. Let's see what else that we have here. Um, somebody says here they were in California and they saw scores of 
Venezuelans, no doubt. I'm sure you would see them in New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, everywhere, every border state. Um, Michael says, Larry, comma, and then nothing else. Well, Michael, it's good to see you. Michael, comma. Um, uh, someone here says here, a lot of elderly were scared to death um, by the government with COVID. It's absolutely true. And I feel, um, I feel uh, more sympathy with that crowd. I, I, for instance, with my own mother, you know, who's in her 80s, you know, I was telling her, hey, mom, you know, you need to be really, really careful um, what you do. And she wanted to be with her grandchildren. And I said, just make sure what you do is what you want to do because you have to live with, you know, the consequences of your decision. So don't, don't come engage with us at Christmas or Thanksgiving because you feel guilty or that you're being pressured by us to do that. Do it because you want to do that. But you know, it's possible you'll catch a cold, you know, or something. I, I, I don't know. I can't, can make no guarantees of that. And my mother is intelligent and, you know, very independent and she understood that. But we, 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 my wife and I adopted the philosophy that we would respect other people's decisions provided they respected ours. You see there, it's, it's, it's a two way street. Um, I'm not going to shame you for wearing a mask. If you want to wear one, fine. Um, if you want to get every booster shot available, feel free to do it. I won't shame you into doing that. But when you start pressuring me to do that, I'm going to start pushing back because I feel a little bit, I feel a little bit differently about that. Got someone here who says the friendly evangelist. Hey, Larry, I'm a Ukrainian immigrant to America. I'm a Christian YouTube creator too. Well, fabulous. We're glad to have you in America. Just make sure you obey and respect the laws. <laughs> Let's see, what else here? Larry, do you believe in the rapture? I do, but I will say that I am a pan-millennial, and that means I believe it will all pan out no matter what I think regarding it. Some people love to live in, in biblical prophecy. They live in Revelation. They live in the book of Daniel, Isaiah. They love that stuff. And they see in every every major event, uh, political major event, they're sure that they can find that event somewhere in scripture. I'm far less sure when it comes to things like that. And um, I try to, try to keep my focus on doing the things that the Lord would have me do. And not because I think those, those books or those passages are meaningless. I, I don't think that, but I'm very mindful of what the Lord said, which is a caveat to all of that. And that is that not even the son knows, only the father knows. And um, so what I think about when something is or isn't going to happen in terms of biblical prophecy is really irrelevant because it's going to happen um, when it's going to happen. And the Lord hasn't consulted me about it. <laughs> so let's see here. Yeah, I love this right here. Um, Rick Shepard says, 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. Yes, I'm with you on that. Um, uh, let's see what else here it says. Uh, someone here is um, uh, says they 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 wish well on me and my family. Thank you so much. I um, I appreciate that. I was about to comment to a on on something and it just went scrolling by um, very quickly. But a lot of people are responding to my comments about the fear of death. Um, Don't live your life in terror. Um, I, I obviously, if you follow what I do, you know that I go to some dangerous places, um, for sure. Um, and that's because I believe that's my calling. It isn't because I'm trying to get clicks. It's not because I'm trying to impress you. I'm more secure in my manhood than that. Uh, it's because I believe it's important. I believe it's, a, it's an important part of my work. It's an important part of my calling. When I say calling, I mean God's call upon my life. So I don't do them. Some people will say, hey, Larry, we'll protect you. Well, there's no guarantee of that. Isaiah was put into a hollow log and sawn in half, and he was, he was very faithful. Um, and I recall Jesus saying, uh, who was crucified, by the way, that the... Um, the students should expect better than his teacher. So I don't expect better than my teacher. Now I try not to take really unnecessary risks, but you know, I joked the other, you know, in an interview I recently did 
with um, Jim Ferguson, we were talking about this, this very subject. This is the podcast we dropped. What is today? Thursday. I think we dropped it on Tuesday a couple of days ago. Um, he was talking about, you know, fear, uh, you know, of retribution of, of, of people doing something to people like him or to me and me being at the World Economic Forum and him saying that he at the time had, you know, warned me and he was going to send some Scots down there to protect me. Um, sometimes these things are overblown. Sometimes they're, they're, they're actually underestimated. Um, people don't, you know, sometimes take themselves unwittingly into very dangerous circumstances uh, when they, uh, they do so very unwisely. I mean, at least if you're going to make sure that you, that you, you know, that you are. But as I said to Jim in that particular interview, when it comes to death, I think a little bit like Hugh Glass, the subject of the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, um, the Revenant, um, and Hugh Glass said this, if you, you know, there's a scene in that movie that's really intense and it's where he's attacked by a bear and, um, horribly. And the bear leaves him for dead. And Hugh Glass said, uh, I ain't afraid of dying because I've done done it. You know, I've already done it. And, um, I kind of feel a little bit that way as somebody who has, you know, um, suffered horribly, um, in a terrible accident was revived, um, spent a lot of time in, intensive care, um, trauma burn unit, um, and wasn't expected to live. If there's anything that comes out of an experience like that, and I think I had this mentality just a little bit even before then, but if there's anything that comes out of that, it is not a fear of death. Um, it's, it's to live my life more open-handed and to say, Lord, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here right now, I'm talking to you because the Lord willed it. Uh, he wasn't ready to take me home. And there are aspects of, of that whole event in my life. And um, a, um, I guess what people would call, it sounds very trite, a near-death experience um, that has caused me to live my life more freely. Um, and with the understanding that my life is 100% in the Lord's hands. And I'm not gonna leave this earth one nanosecond before he's ready to take me. And one day he will wanna take me and I don't know how he'll wanna take me, but, um, but, but that's a reality. And yet there's so many people that I know that they live in terror of absolutely everything. They live in fear of absolutely everything. And fear is not rational. You know, fear is not rational. It's hard to talk people out of fear. If you've ever been with someone in a really dangerous circumstance as I have, and they begin to freak out, you, you aren't gonna be able to talk them off that tree. Um, that's, that's just where they are. So um, you have to prepare for those kinds of things and develop a mindset as you go into it. But am I a guy that's you know, utterly without fear? I hate heights. <laughs> it's funny, I, you know, I just don't like heights. Uh, I don't like heights at all. Um, you know, Indiana Jones, he hated snakes. I'm not particularly bothered by snakes, but the point is there are things that I don't, I don't particularly care for. And then there are, you know, others, but, um, but we do want to, we do want to live our wise, wi uh, live our lives wisely. But at the same time, we want to be able to fulfill our mission and the things that the Lord has called us to. And if there's anything that is sorely lacking in the West right now, it's courage. It's courage. I mean, I mean, just little doses of courage. I'm not talking about, you know, into the valley road, the 600, into the jaws of death. We're not even asking for that level of courage from Christians in the culture. We're just talking about willing to um, risk your comfort, risk your wealth. We're just talking about being willing to risk being ostracized, being willing uh, to have people say mean things uh, to you. Are you willing to do that? Most of the Christians I know, the answer to that is no. And yesterday I did see on social media, and I thought about using this in, in a podcast, and I, may, I might. I don't really know the circumstances of this, and I think it was in Spain, though I might be wrong. But it was a woman standing like this in front of a statue. Maybe some of you saw it. But it's a statue that, I don't know who they were, BLM or Antifa or you know some anarchist types, but they were spray painting it and damaging it. And it was... Uh, this woman was probably a, um, a Catholic, I'm going to guess, because this was a statue of a Catholic saint. So she went and stood in front of it, and the camera showed 
hundreds of people watching this. Now, I would, I would guess that the majority of those people who are watching are just watching because they're fascinated because it's a standoff between this one woman and these anarchists, um, these criminals who are just destroying public property. But I kept thinking to myself, more of this, please. This one woman was exhibiting more courage than many men I know. And her courage was such that, the, that these people stopped doing what they were doing. But I kept thinking, why aren't there men in that crowd saying, I'm gonna run up there and protect that woman who was protecting the statue? You don't have, you didn't have to have any appreciation of the statue. There's just part of me that you would think someone would say, this woman, somebody, the people are gonna start throwing things at her. They're, they're, maybe gonna, they're maybe gonna harm this woman. I'm gonna protect her because I admire her courage. We need more of that. We need people who are willing to say enough is enough. I'm not gonna tolerate that. And that doesn't mean storming the Capitol. Um, it can be done peacefully, but it can be done, it can be done with absolute courage. And that means writing, you know, to, um, uh, as I say, be annoying, writing your, your um, governmental representatives annoying those people, letting them know what you will and will not tolerate. Your school boards running for public office in some cases, if you feel, if you feel so called, but also venting your mind um, to um, um, those companies that maybe where you've patronized and spent money and saying, listen, you're pushing an agenda here. I'm not spending my money with you anymore. I'm done with you, Disney, or I'm done with you, Coca-Cola or Bud Light or whatever it is. There are a variety of ways that you can, uh, can do this. Uh, someone here says, are you Chuck Norris? <laughs> well, someone else here says, are you a fan of, uh, excuse me, I'm no fan of Jordan Peterson. I, listen, I want to be really clear in saying this. I do like Jordan Peterson. I can't say that I listen to Jordan Peterson a lot. I, uh, I haven't. Uh, but that's not because of Jordan Peterson. It's because I don't listen really to any podcast. And that's because I don't want it to influence what I'm saying in my own because you can, you can start subtly copying other people. So I just try to stay away from that and, uh, and formulate my own opinions. But I'm glad to have him fighting on our side. I just find it strange that he's just written a book about God. Um, I mean, you, you, you don't believe in God. You, you, you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ. That's kind of an odd thing to do. I mean, to me, it's like somebody who says, you know, I really don't like music, but I'm gonna teach the subject anyway. Makes no sense. France is effed up, someone says. Having lived there, I can tell you this is absolutely true. George Soros project, um, Ranger's good boy. Ranger has gone in to the house um, now. He's decided the heck with all of you people. <laughs> um, the Chuck Norris comment is funny. You know, I never saw too many Chuck Norris movies. I, didn't, I was never really into those type of movies. And, uh, and I, I didn't ever really see his show, um, Walker, Texas Ranger, but I was channel surfing and I came across it and I started watching and I thought, you know, this is actually wholesome and fun. I, I like it. So I'd love to have Chuck Norris on the podcast sometime. I bet he's a great guy. Larry, your vet, important people, uh, educated. Da, da, da. Um, Keith here says Catholicism has nothing in common with Christianity. Keith, I, I want to say this carefully. I understand where you're coming from, and um, I understand why you would say that, um, because if you look at this current pope, um, for instance, Boy, that guy. Um, but I'm Reformed, Calvinist even, which, you know, kind of makes me by definition sort of anti-Catholic. I mean, because, because Calvinist, Calvinism, you know, was born out of the Reformation. Um, you know, Calvin wrote um, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. He was educated within... Uh, of the Catholic Church. Uh, he was given a, um, a classical education. Martin Luther, I mean, was a Catholic um, who was trying to reform the Catholic Church, but it should become very corrupt. But I would want to urge you, if you are, I love my Catholic fans um, uh, here. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are saved. Believe upon Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. I have some excellent 
Catholic friends. Um, I disagree with them. For instance, I chiefly believe sola scriptura. I don't believe in the church as an authority. I believe sola scriptura. That said, I mean, do I think Antonin Scalia is in heaven? 100%. Do I believe he's? Do I believe he he knew Jesus Christ? Yes, and I I would I would want him in my foxhole any day. Um, there are some wonderful Catholic brothers and sisters who have been huge supporters of mine, huge encouragement um, to me, and uh, I hope to them um, in some way. Um, some of them are well known and are people who always say, Larry, you know you should be a Catholic. Why aren't you a Catholic? And I always say, well, because there's this little problem of sola scriptura. But I, um, I would caution anyone who is prepared to say that, you know, all Catholics aren't Christians in the same way that I have known some Catholics who say that if you're not, if you're not, if you're not Catholic, you can't be a Christian. I would caution both of those parties. If you believe in Jesus Christ, there's, there's a lot that can be wrong with your theology that the Lord will tolerate if you have given your life to him. And I think that one day we will get to heaven and find out that we were all wrong about quite a few things. Um, I do, but I believe the Lord's net is bigger than our net at times. And um, again, uh, I myself was very heavily influenced uh, in my thinking um, by, say, a great Catholic mind like uh, Etienne Gilson, if you haven't read him, oh, wow, um, fantastic stuff. Um, uh, Cardinal Henry Newman. Uh, Newman had some funny ideas. Newman also had some spectacular. Uh, his writing on the university, to this day, it reads like it was written yesterday. And there's just no Protestant who was writing like that. Um, it's fantastic, fantastic stuff. Uh, I also have, um, you know, you know, dear friends who are Catholic. So I would just say, um, be be careful in uh, in saying that. Um, by the way, I do want this to be a little bit of a fellowship. Sean, thank you so much for for donating to support this show. I'm grateful for that. It's very kind of you to do that. Um, and I am, by the way, I apologize that these go so fast that it's hard for me to comment to them all. I do later try to go back through comments and try to respond to some of them where I can. For the most part, I just put a, a, a like, you know, a thumbs up or something, just to let you know that I did read it um, because there's so many, it's hard for me to respond to them all, but don't let that discourage you. It doesn't mean that I don't value your opinion. If you're part of the posse and you're sincere and, you know, constructively a part of this, I am grateful to have you here. It's, um, it's wonderful. Beth Reichert says this, here's a good verse, Psalm 73, 28. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord, it's disappeared on me. Uh, I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may, <laughs> it's disappeared to me again, that I may tell you, tell of all your works. Yes, you know, David is saying there, he says, I will not restrain. He says elsewhere in the Psalms, I will not restrain my tongue um, when speaking of your wonders of your mercies, of your greatness in speaking to the assembly. Let us not, let us not be afraid um, to speak the truth and to proclaim the greatness of our God. You know, one of the things that I think is interesting as somebody who has engaged a lot in Christian apolog uh, apologetics, uh, somebody who's debated publicly and privately, a lot of atheists, now the sun has really hit me dead on, so forgive me here, um, is... Uh, I find a lot of Christians think they do God some kind of favor by not bringing him into the conversation or by not bringing the word, scripture, into the conversation. And I learned early on that the whole goal, from my point of view, was to A, bring God up, and B, was to get people into the word. And that's because Larry Taunton's words are not as sharp as a two-edged sword. It doesn't mean the Lord can't use Larry Taunton's words. Um, I think he does and has many times. But I want to get them in the word because I want them an unbeliever at the end of the day, not be wrestling with what I said. I want them to be wrestling with what God said. I don't want it to be my personality versus their personality, my politics, uh, my skin color, my whatever, my nationality versus theirs. I want them in scripture wrestling with what God said. And if you read the faith of Christopher Hitchens, um, 
uh, on my book, which was, um, <laughs> you know, much acclaimed, a named book of the year, but then the left came out and, and uh, decided to attack me for it. Uh, in that book, you will know that with Christopher Hitchens, the, the, the famed atheist, um, the infamous atheist who um, died of esophageal cancer, my goal with him was to get him into scripture. And the way I did that was just to shame him. He, you know, say, Christopher, you keep making all these outrageous claims about scripture. I don't think you've ever read it. And so I challenged him to a study of the Gospel of John. I love using the Gospel of John. It's a great introductory book for an unbeliever. And, um, and so <laughs> I tell the story in that book how we were driving along. I'm driving my Chevrolet Tahoe, which is what I had at the time. Christopher is drinking Johnny Walker Black Label that is squeezed between his knees, and he is reading aloud um, the Bible. And in that rich um, British uh, Richard Burton-esque baritone of his, and then we're discussing those, those verses. So he was reading aloud, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we would stop and discuss those verses. And I would just say to him, hey, Christopher, what do, you, do you recognize that opening verse? Does that opening verse mean anything to you? In the beginning, he thought about it for a minute. He said, Genesis 1-1. He said, I had to memorize it when I, was, when I was a kid. I said, yeah, so is John just a plagiarist hoping no one in his audience will recognize those words? Or do you think that he's opening his gospel by signaling the reader, the God that I'm talking about here is the same one of Genesis 1-1, the same one who in that chapter said, let there be light. And I could see that Christopher was starting to go, oh, wow, maybe the Bible has more depth than I realized that he had. And we started pulling back the layers. But again, my goal was to get him where he was wrestling with scripture, not wrestling with Larry Taunton. So at the end of the day, he's faced with making the decision, do you believe what John has to say? Not what Larry has to say, but do you think John is a crackpot or do you think that he's reliable? Other questions here. Hello from OKC, good to have you here. Um, let's see, uh, someone else here says, Trump is taking care of everything that we as Americans can't. Don't put your hope in Donald Trump. Uh, Vote for him if you want to vote for him. But if all your hope is in Donald Trump, it is a poor hope. And I don't mean that as a crack against Donald Trump. Don't put your hope in Larry Taunton. It's poor hope. Um, I'm fallible. Donald, Tr uh, Donald Trump is fallible. Um, I will fail you. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. He is your only hope. And then act accordingly. And that means politically and otherwise. But uh, Donald Trump can't fix everything. He just simply can't fix everything. I'd love to say that he, that he could, but he can't. He doesn't have that, um, he doesn't have that power. Let's see, what else? Uh, my friends who know, uh, who are Catholic, who know and love Jesus, the Lord can save anyone. And that means he can save, if he can save, if he can save somebody like Manasseh, you know, king of the Old Testament who sacrificed his own son, burning a child to pagan deities, he can save anyone. And that even means Methodists. <laughs> yeah, somebody says here, Keith says that, uh, that Chuck Norris is a Christian. Uh, that is my understanding. Boy, I'm having a hard time seeing these now with the, the sun here. Um, uh, listen, listen, until Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg, which he was right to do. Our heritage is what you might call Catholic. I mean, St. Augustine, who I'm currently reading, was what we might call Catholic. He was part of that, you know, that great tradition. Luther himself was, Calvin was. And, um, and I'm just not prepared to say that, that everybody since 1517 if they're in the Catholic church, they're all going to hell. Any more than I'm prepared to say that everybody who goes to a Protestant church is going to heaven. There's gonna be a lot of Protestants in hell. There's gonna be a lot of pro-lifers um, in hell. 
Um, trying to convert someone into voting for Trump gets them no closer to Jesus. Do, do bear that in mind. Well, let's see. I'm glad to have a lot of you here. Um, let's see. Um, you know what? Somebody here who says, just found you. And that is Kimmy Lynn. Kimmy Lynn, I'm glad that you, uh, glad, Kimmy Lynn, I'm glad to be found. I'm so glad to be found. Um, and I hope you'll help us grow the posse. I hope you'll become an investor in what we're gonna build here. And um, I'm really excited about the stuff that we have in the future. I don't wanna abandon you guys before I'm able to look at some of the, some of the, some of the questions that, um, that some of you have here. Uh, have you ever done a deep dive in Psalm 119? It will change your life. I can't say that I have, um, but I believe you. I believe that that's true. Um, someone here saying she thinks I'm doing a great job. Thank you so much, Maria, for saying that. Any thoughts on Tommy Robinson? I really don't have any. Um, someone here says Donald Trump is the savior of America. I, I don't believe any thoughtful conservative ever says things like that. I think these are plants. I think these are trolls who are trying to push people into saying um, these kinds of things. Same person says he's a prophet. He isn't a prophet. He's a, he's a political figure. He's no different from, from Ronald Reagan or Eisenhower or anybody else in the sense that he is a, he is a political figure. And I would say that, that his understanding of the Christian faith, if he's a believer, uh, not for me to say, he says that he is, um, is still in its infancy. But I am, I am grateful that, that, that he is certainly willing to stand against evil in this country. God is sovereign. Yes, indeed, he is. Oh, here's a great question from Wilderness. Any comments on Francis Schaeffer? I love Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer died of cancer in 1984. My wife is a huge fan of his wife, um, Edith Schaefer, who probably died, I'm not sure, but probably died in the early 2000s, uh, I don't know. She outlived her husband, I think, by 20 years or more. But Francis and Edith Schaefer um, were very interesting people in the post-World War II world. Francis Schaefer, who was um, one of the founders of the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, which is a, um, has been traditionally a very conservative, not to be confused with the PCUSA, the PCA is a generally very reformed, very uh, conservative um, branch um, of Presbyterianism. He was one of the founders of, um, of that denomination. But post-World War II, he went to Europe to try to get the lay of the land, sort of an understanding of what was taking place in Western culture, kind of the sort of thing that I would do in, in my own travels. And he decided to establish something called Labri um, in Switzerland, which was sort of a, we'll call it kind of a Christian retreat center to help Christians process some of the big issues in life. And a lot of really thoughtful people went through there. Oz Guinness, for instance, um, was, was one of them. And one of my mentors um, was, was one of them. And I, uh, that mentor gave me one of Schaefer's book when I, books when I was 15, How Then Should We Live? And I began, that's pretty heavy lifting for a 15 year old, but I began reading Schaefer um, at that time. I'm very appreciative of Schaefer because Schaefer for me, when I was a young man, I was looking as a thoughtful Christian, as somebody who in his high school years um, and, and collegiate years was trying to take very seriously his faith and looking for a way for my faith to interact with the culture. But there seemed to be only two paths for people like that. And that was, you know, in my own church, there was a big push to try to get me to go into Christian ministry, to get me to be a pastor. And your options were basically three things. You go to seminary, either to become a music minister, a youth minister, which is a stepping stone to becoming, you know, a pastor. And I didn't want to be a pastor. I spoke in a lot of churches and I even pastored at a church for a period of time when I was very young, way too young to be pastoring um, a church, but I did do it um, while I was uh, in college. I would just, you know, this little tiny church, I would 
go and uh, deliver the sermons there on Sunday morning. I think I did that for two years. Uh, that was pretty rough. That was that was pretty hard. Those, those were sweet people. They were they were very kind to me. Um, but Schaefer offered me a path because I didn't really know where to go with with my own Christian faith because I didn't feel called into pastoral ministry. Definitely wasn't called into um, into music ministry and youth ministry, though it has been a key part of my own um, public engagement, my own Christian ministry, that I didn't see that as the ultimate goal of what I was doing. And uh, what I got from, from Schaefer is, Larry, you need to view any endeavor that you're doing in the public space as a calling to serve Jesus Christ, whatever it is. And uh, that's whether you're a forklift driver or um, whether you're a columnist. And of course, I went to you know, I pursued academic degrees, I was teaching for a time, and then I became a columnist. And I saw myself very much engaging in what I call Trojan horse ministry. That is to say, I am acting covertly in the culture as an advocate for and defender of the Christian faith. And it was, it was Francis Schaeffer who provided me with that model, that this is what you can do. And, uh, and I followed that model pretty closely, so I'm very grateful for Francis Schaefer. I think very highly of Francis Schaefer. Go online and read, excuse me, go online, go on YouTube and find the talks he gave at Coral Ridge um, PCA Church in, in um, gosh, where is it? It's in Florida. Coral Ridge, I guess. Go and watch his sermons that he gave there, I think in 1981, 82, 83, Somewhere in there, you can find them online. And the very things that he's railing about in those sermons are the things that we're seeing right now. So um, Schaefer was a prophet with a lowercase p, without a doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been awesome to be with you guys. Um, I think my wife is waiting to feed me dinner <laughs> or for me to take her out to dinner. So I think I'm gonna go and fulfill my husbandly um, responsibilities. Ranger is looking at me very forlorn. I think he too is wanting to be fed. But guys, it's been great to be with you. We're gonna build the posse. We're gonna build this up. It's so wonderful to be able to engage you guys. And by the way, I wanna throw this out. I'm thinking about maybe this summer doing a Schaefer-esque, we've done many of these in the past, kind of Um, conference that would maybe start on a Friday night and then go from, say, 10 to 4 p.m. on a Saturday. Now, there would be a fee for that. There'd be a couple of meals that are involved in that, but it would be the kind of thing where you guys can engage with each other. But I think I would want to keep it, you know, fairly small so that I can engage um, with people. But it would be a kind of um, cultural engagement conference, um, explaining some of the big issues, taking your questions face-to-face -face and engaging with you. Now, if that's something that sounds like uh, that would appeal to you, please do let me know. Drop it in the comments. I might not be able to read it right now, um, but I'll eventually try to get over there and take a look at it. And if that sounds like something you would like, um, you know, we might do that. Um, I'm not sure what the cost of it would be. Depends on if we have to rent a facility or not. If we do, then the cost goes up dramatically because costs for, um, for um, rentals are significant. Uh, whether or not I have other speakers or it's just me um, who does it, that also drives up costs and meals and things of that nature. But if you budget for things that actually matter to you, then this might be something that you'd like a lot. So listen, I hope you guys have had a good time. Been great to see you guys. We'll get better at this as we go along. Um, so you guys have a great evening. Talk to you later.